So I think we're finally at a place where we can relate what we've learned so far in quantum mechanics to what we learned in introductory chemistry. So here's the key point. Those wave functions that we've been uh, solving for in the Schrodinger equation and now for the hydrogen atom, those wave functions are associated with orbitals. So orbitals, remember we talked about orbitals in introductory chemistry. Those essentially are the wave functions we get from the solution to the Schrodinger equation. There's a little subtlety which we'll talk about in just a minute so there cannot be a one-to-one -one correspondence. But basically orbitals are wave functions. Now orbitals are used in uh, several different ways, at least three I can think of. So depending on the context, the chemist when he talks or she talks about orbitals may mean one of three things. For example, orbitals just may mean the uh, wave function you get from the Schrodinger equation. Orbitals may mean the square of the wave function that you get from the Schrodinger equation, in other words, probability density. Or orbitals may mean, um, for instance, a shape in which you've drawn a constant probability contour in which you're, say, uh, have a certain probability of finding the electron within a particular volume. So orbitals are not really defined precisely in chemistry, uh, but generally they're associated with one way or another of plotting the wave functions. Now, uh, they have three, and we have three quantum numbers, n, l, and m sub l. n is called the principal quantum number. Wave functions that are distinguished by different values of n are called shells. And then within a given value of n, you could have various values of m sub, or various values of l, and those are called subshells. And those values of l have names associated with them. l equals zero is the s. L equal 1 is the P, L equal 2 is the D, 3F, 4G, uh, 5H, and so on. So now we know what we mean when we say uh, hydrogen 1S orbital. We mean that N equal 1 and L equal 0. All right, so we've connected, I hope, a solution to the Schrodinger equation with these orbitals we've talked about in introductory chemistry. Now, as I mentioned, it's not a strict one-to-one -one correspondence between an orbital and a wave function. In some cases, we have to take combinations of them. To see what I mean here, uh, let's look at these hydrogen atom wave functions. These are solutions to the Schrodinger equation for a hydrogen atom. This is n equal 1, l equals 0, so we call this a 1s orbital. Here is n equal 2, l equals 0, so this would be the 2s orbital. Here's the n equal 2, l equal 1, l equal 1, l equal 1. So these three will then be the uh, 2p orbitals. And, and here we have different values of m sub l. The values of m sub l have these imaginary components to the wave function, e to the minus i phi for m sub l equal minus 1, m sub l equal plus 1 has e to the i phi. Now chemists, using their chemistry intuition, would like to have these orbitals, or would like to have orbitals they talk about, be real numbers. Uh, imaginaries are too con uh, just uh, <laughs> confuses or makes things more complex with those imaginary numbers. Okay, so how can uh, chemists get rid of that imaginary parts of the wave function. And so you just have real wave functions. Uh, I mean, wave functions that uh, consist of real numbers. Well, that's where you get combinations of wave functions. So let's see if we can intelligently combine these two wave functions, m sub l equal minus 1 and plus 1, in such a way to get rid of that imaginary component to the wave function. Okay, so this is what we do. Uh, here we take the, um, let's look here at the p. This would be the p orbitals here. This would be l equal 1. All right, we're going to add those two, m sub l equal 1 and minus 1, and take 1 over square root of 2. This is, as you may remember, a normalization constant, so we get the same amplitude back. And we're going to subtract those two. And this time we're going to multiply by 1 over the square root of 2 times i. And let me just do that for the p orbitals and show you that that gets rid of that imaginary part of the wave function. All right, so let's uh, go up again here. Uh, let's ignore all this stuff. These are constants. This is the radial part of the wave function. So let's focus just on 
sine theta e to the i phi and sine theta e to the minus uh, e to the minus i phi and e to the i phi. Okay, let's focus in on that. So we'll say that um, we'll denote. Let me use actually the symbol y to denote this uh, spherical harmonic of one minus one. That was the sine of theta, that angular polar uh, angular spherical coordinate, times e to the minus i phi. And similarly, the uh, there we go again. The uh, plus one m sub l equal plus one was sine theta e to the i phi. All right, so let's combine them in such a way uh, to get rid of that. And we're going to say we're going to add them and then we're going to subtract them. All right, let's also make use of the Euler relation. So e to the i phi, that's equal to cosine of phi plus i sine of phi. All right, so let's add psi phi, y one one plus y one minus one. All right, and again, I'm ignoring all the constants that should be multiplied in front of these because this just those those are just constants. This contains the angular dependence. All right, so we'll say it's sine theta. Um, we're going to add these two, so I'm going to pull out the sine theta. This is e to the minus i phi plus e to the i phi. We're going to use the Euler relation. This is sine theta cosine phi minus, that's a minus i, replace i with minus i, minus i sine phi. And then we're going to have this term, that's cosine phi plus i sine phi. So, all right, well that's interesting because note that these cancel out. So this is just equal to two sine theta cosine phi. Well, that was handy. And we're going to do the normalization one over the square root of two so we multiply this by 1 over square root of 2 and we do the normalization psi star psi we'll get um, uh, we'll get the proper normalization all right so that's what we happen happened when we uh, added the two and now let's see what happens when we subtract the two I'll keep the normalization constant here I should have done that before uh, 1 over square root of 2 now we're going to say y uh, y that's a y not a psi of 1 1 minus y of 1 minus 1. All right well maybe you can guess what's going to happen <laughs> but let me just say that that's equal to a sine of theta pull that out e to the i phi minus e to the minus i phi. Okay that's equal to sine theta we use the Euler relation cosine of uh, let's see cosine of uh, phi plus i sine of phi and we're going to subtract this out so this would be minus cosine of phi minus i sine of phi and that comes out to be sine of phi sine sine of theta then I again forgot to keep around this normalization constant so let me do this 1 over i square root of 2 1 over i square root of 2 uh, so what do we have here so we have this 1i and that's subtracting so that's assigned phi and then we have 2i and note the i's cancel out so by doing all that uh, we got rid of by combining uh, subtracting the two and by adding the two we got rid of the imaginary parts of the wave function so that was pretty cool and so now we can have uh, real parts of the wave function and that's what chemists talk about 
So when you talk about orbitals, they don't necessarily mean exactly the same thing as uh, the wave function. So if the wave function has an imaginary part, then chemists combine those in such a way that the imaginary part goes away. So no longer is m sub l a good quantum number. Uh, we've now combined the wave functions. So if you uh, see something like this, well, it looks like uh, m sub l down here. Uh, m sub l equals 0 is OK. But here, m sub l equal minus 1. That does not correspond to a px or py. m sub l equal plus 1 does not correspond uh, to a px or py, because we combine those two in such a way. OK, now you may be asking, well, you know, can you combine these things like this? I mean, what's the deal here? Um, you know, do you have the same solution to the Schrodinger equation? Well, if you have two wave functions that are degenerate, each one of those and each one of those is a solution to the Schrodinger equation, then any linear combination of those two degenerate wave functions is also a solution to the Schrodinger equation. So we combine it by adding them and subtracting them, those are both, or those are also solutions to the Schrodinger equation. So we're perfectly valid in calling these our wave functions instead of just the individual spherical harmonics.